Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be the role of referrals in inequality, immobility, and inefficiency in labor markets. I would like to welcome Emmanuel to the stage to begin our session. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our talk. I, it's my, my great pleasure to be joined by Nicole Imorlika. Uh, Nicole's research lies broadly within the field of alg algorithm ga algorithmic game theory, using tools and modeling concepts from both theoretical computer science and economics. Uh, Nicole hopes to explain, predict, and shape behavioral patterns in various online and offline systems. Um, and it's my pleasure to listen to Nicole discuss the roles of referrals and inequality and immobility. Nicole, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the role of referrals in inequality, immobility, and inefficiency in labor markets. This is joint work with Lucas Bolt, who's a graduate student at Stanford, and Matt Jackson, who's an economist uh, professor at Stanford. And uh, before I get into this topic, I just want to mention that um, I was originally going to talk about role, uh, a system for identity. Uh, and how we can create a decentralized system for identity that's not tied to any particular government. I'm still particularly passionate about that topic. If you want to connect with me uh, in the um, networking components of the conference, I would be delighted to chat about uh, that topic. But in light of recent events, I thought that it was particularly important to talk about inequality. Uh, and so as a way of introduction, um, I want to think, I, I don't think I need to convince you that there's growing inequality in society. This happens across, uh, you know, the society as a whole, but also across demographics where some demographics have higher income and employment uh, than other demographics. This growing inequality uh, also causes an immobility in which uh, children's outcomes tend to be similar to their parents. And so generation after generation, people can be tied into the same uh, outcomes as, as their parents. Uh, and together, these, as we will see in the context of this talk, uh, obviously create some sort of inequity or uh, you know, unfairness in our society. But they also have implications for the productivity of the economy. And they uh, will see that the inequality and the immobility create an inefficiency uh, such that we aren't producing as much as we could as a society um, if we were a more equal society. So before I get into uh, the sort of mechanisms that, that I'm going to focus on in this paper, I want to emphasize that there are many causes for inequality and I'm going to point just you know pinpoint one of them and there's a lot of causes of inequality that are cultural, and we really need to address these. These are racism, prejudice, classist attitudes, and so on. But in my talk, what I wanna focus on are structural causes of inequality. And in particular, I'm gonna be looking at social networks and thinking about how social networks uh, contribute to inequality. And the reason that social networks are important for studying inequality is because so many of the resources of society are distributed through our social networks. In particular, in this talk, I'm gonna be interested in uh, jobs. And here's a quote from Frank Robinson that uh, illuminates the you know, anecdotal knowledge we all hold that social networks are important for jobs. And Frank Robinson was a famous baseball player and he said, I've never seen baseball advertised for a job, and I've never heard of whites applying for a job. I mean, there's an old boy network and it's really white. So as he's suggesting, and as we all intuitively know, many jobs are, uh, people find many of their jobs through referrals. And there's a bunch of uh, evidence to this fact, empirical evidence pointing to this fact. I cite this in the paper that's related to this talk, which you can find online. 
Uh, 50 to 70 percent of jobs are found through referrals across all skill levels. An increase in connections to executives by 50 percent will increase wages by 20 percent. The marginal effect of having an additional peer gaining employment increases uh, a worker's likelihood of employment by 0.8 percent. And this is in a pretty clever randomized uh, experiment, um, natural experiment. So you can take a look at those if you're interested in, in justification for the, the observation that referrals are important for getting jobs. But let's uh, move on and think about inequality. So I said that there's growing inequality in society and I don't think I need to convince you of this, but just to give you some data, here's a graph that was plotted by my uh, co-author Matt Jackson showing the Gini index, which is a measure of inequality in a society over years. Um, and what you can see is that in China, the US and the UK, all three of these nations, the Gini index started to increase rapidly around the late 70s. Um, and so as this indicates that there's been growing inequality in our society for the past many decades. This inequality, as I uh, suggested, is related to um, uh, immobility, and this is a what's called the Gatsby curve. Uh, this is showing a measure of immobility, uh, uh, plotting it against a measure of inequality. And what you can see is that the countries that tend to have higher inequality, like uh, we just saw in the last uh, chart, that the U.S. and China have high inequality and growing inequality, they also have higher mobility than the countries with less inequality, like Denmark. Um, and the mechanism through which we're going to think about in a, uh, the, the cause of inequality is a social network. Uh, so this is one reason that social networks are going to uh, cause inequality across demographics is that social networks are naturally concentrated among demographics such that you tend to be friends with the people that you tend to hang around. And the people that you tend to hang around are naturally a bit more like you because of where you were born and, and what the activities you pursue. Uh, this social network shows that that sort of homophily that I'm referring to actually uh, exists in practice. This is from the Ad Health data. Um, and the uh, links, each node here is a student at a high school. The links are friendships and the black nodes are uh, black students at the high school, the white nodes are white students, uh, the yellow nodes are white students, uh, and then there's um, some Hispanic students and some multi-ethnic students. But what you can see, what I want you to notice is that there's many more connections between the black students or between the white students and few connections uh, that are uh, biracial. So, um, once we start thinking about different demographics, uh, all the statistics I told you are distributed unequally across demographics. And this is a plot you've seen many like them, I'm sure, showing that uh, blacks tend to do worse than whites, both in terms of unemployment rates and in terms of hourly earnings. So uh, what I'd like to think about in this talk is the impact of referrals that we discussed uh, with the Frank Robinson quote, how do referrals impact things like productivity? How much does the economy produce? Uh, inequality, how uh, unequal are different demographics in terms of employment and wages? And immobility, uh, how difficult is it to do much better than your parents uh, across generations? And so uh, what we'll see is that referrals have an impact on each of these uh, metrics. For productivity, referrals are actually super important in labor markets. It's not, you know, a bad thing that firms use referrals to uh, select employees because referrals give firms a chance to vet potential workers, and this improves the match of the worker to the firm. Um, it's well documented that referred workers uh, have a much lower turnover rate, for example, than uh, workers that are hired on the open market. Uh, there's also, uh, the, you know, on the other, on the flip side, uh, referrals 
you can expect to cause inequality because if a, some group of workers just tends to have fewer referrals, then they're going to be disadvantaged given that the firms are hiring through the referrals. Uh, and also then that should naturally lead to immobility because um, the in the future generations, if a particular group had less referrals, they're going to have less employment and therefore be able to share less referrals in the future. So uh, I'm going to, in this talk, that, that was the motivation and sort of background. Uh, through the course of this talk, I want to present to you a model uh, of referrals and labor net, uh, markets. I'll then discuss uh, in efficiency and inequality. Uh, then we'll think about a dynamic model, so uh, we can look at this across generations, and then we'll discuss policies to uh, address these issues. So I'm a theorist, and I use a theoretical lens to gain insight into uh, how the world works, as, as Annie said in the, my introduction. Um, so this is a theoretical model. I'm imagining that I have a mass one of long-lived firms a mass N of workers. There's the math, I'll keep the math very light here, but um, the important point is that there's more workers than firms. So there's some baseline level of unemployment. Uh, and then there's each worker has an ability, which is gonna be some value drawn from a distribution that the firms know. And the productivity of a worker, that is how much value the worker produces if he is employed, is going to be equal to her ability and independent of the firm where she is employed. So that's the basic model. Um, now in the context of that model, I'm interested in referrals. So how am I gonna think about referrals? I'm imagining that every firm is employing exactly one worker and that one worker that's employed by the firm in the current generation gets to refer exactly one worker from the next generation. Uh, so this is a simple model, but it'll allow us to illuminate some particularly stark effects of referral networks. Uh, so this is going to then induce a referral distribution. So you look at all of the next generation workers, you can look at what fraction of them have K referrals for any particular K. Uh, so P of zero, for example, is the fraction of workers that have no referral. Their only chance of being hired is on the open market by firms that did not hire through the referral market. Um, then we're also going to uh, have a sort of, a, a, we're going to study an equilibrium of this labor market in which a firm is going to know the ability of a referred worker. Uh, so that's the benefit of referrals. I, I can bet that candidate more accurately than a candidate on the open market. The firm can then try to hire the referred worker if the firm thinks that her ability is sufficiently high. Uh, if the firm decides not to hire the referred worker or loses out to the competition for that worker, then the firm can try to um, uh, go to the pool and hire someone from the pool. This is the pool of all workers that are unemployed or didn't get jobs on the referral market. And in the pool, we assume that the firm hires one worker just at random from the pool. Um, so here's the sort of picture I have in my mind when I think about this model. I have a set of employed workers throughout the talk. I'll represent employed workers by solid shapes and unemployed workers by uh, shapes that are shaded uh, with diagonal lines. I have also two types of workers in my uh, labor market. I have blue circles and green triangles. Uh, and every employed worker, which are the workers in the current generation, which are the uh, workers on the top left of the picture here, gets to refer one next period worker. Uh, and that referral is represented by a line between the uh, current worker and the next period worker. So this is, this is the model. Now, what's the equilibrium look like? What are firms gonna do in this model? Uh, firms are going to hire their referred worker. So each firm has one referred worker, right? So the firm is going to hire that worker if her ability is higher than some threshold. So firms come up with some hiring threshold in their mind and they're like, is this worker good enough to pass that threshold? If the worker passes the threshold, they hire her. Otherwise, uh, they reject her and go to the pool. 
And sometimes, like the second and third firm in the picture here, uh, they lose out to competition because maybe one worker has multiple referrals and they're going to lose out to the competition. If they lose out to the competition for that worker, then they again also go to the pool. So uh, the let's think about how that works. Here's, the, as I said, the second and third firm are competing for the third next period worker. And let's say that the third firm loses the competition. So that firm now has to go higher from the pool. The other way in which a firm might have to go higher from the pool is if uh, the firm is uh, looks at their referred worker and realizes that her ability is not high enough, that she, her, her uh, value didn't pass the hiring threshold. In this case, the firm will reject that worker and go to the pool. But notice something very interesting is happening now. This worker that was just rejected on the referral market is entering the pool and has a lower value you know, the, entering the pool having not passed some hiring threshold, therefore has a lower value than the average worker in the population as a whole. We call this the, a lemon's effect. So we think of this worker as a lemon because she's basically souring the pool of unemployed workers. She's dragging down the average value of the unemployed workers. And that's important because the average value of unemployed workers is naturally the bar that the firms are going to set on the value of the workers that they want to hire, because that's their outside option. They can just go to the pool and hire from the pool. So if they're on the referral market, they're really looking for people that are better than the unemployed. And these lemons are dragging down the value of the unemployed, thereby dragging down the hiring threshold and getting more workers to be hired on the referral market. And so, as you can see, this hiring threshold is some sort of fixed point, some equilibrium, as we call it, of this hiring game, and which balances out the lemons and the uh, requirement for being hired on the referral market. So this so-called lemons effect, uh, which succinctly is the fact that the average value of unemployed workers, that is the workers in the pool, is less than the average value of workers in the population overall. That's, that's what I mean by the lemons effect. Um, this, uh, the first thing to ask is, how does the distribution of referrals impact the lemons effect? And what you can realize is that a higher concentration of referrals, like the labor market on the left here, creates less lemons. Why? Because there, if there's a high concentration of referrals, like one worker has all the referrals, then the, are, there are a lot of workers in the pool that have never been vetted before. And hence they didn't fail some kind of like hiring threshold. If, on the other hand, you could look at the plot on the right, the, the market on the right here, and you see that there's a very uh, low concentration of referrals. And now there's a lot of vetting. The pool starts out smaller. The firms do a lot of vetting and the pool is heavily polluted by these so-called lemons, the people that failed to pass the hiring threshold on the referral market. So uh, that's, that's the model and, and some in, we've already learned something interesting, which is that the unemployed workers are, tend to be of worse value than the ones that are hired on the referral market. Um, now we can ask about uh, inequality and inefficiency and see how the referral distribution through this vehicle of the lemons effect that we've discussed is going to impact inequality and inefficiency. So first of all, by inefficiency, I mean I, the same thing or the opposite thing of productivity, right? Like so uh, productivity is the average value of the employed workers. That's how much this society produces in this model. And we have this uh, labor market on the left in which we have a high concentration of referrals versus the labor market on the right. And you might want to ask yourself now and think a little bit about this, which of these labor markets do you expect to produce higher value? So there's, there's something, there's sort of two effects going on here that you should be contemplating in your head. One is that the market on the left has very little screening. There's only one worker that firms look at on the referral market. 
and that one worker maybe you know it's it's a gold gold mine they they found the 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 diamond in the rough they found the great worker and they're going to keep that worker one one of those firms is going to keep that worker but the other firms are all going to have to hire from the pool and they didn't get this chance to screen a worker they didn't get an extra draw if you want to think of it that way um, they only got to see one worker instead of two uh, on the other hand the market on the left also as we discussed earlier has a smaller lemons effect so going to the pool isn't so bad the pool is almost as good as the average productivity of the a worker in the population overall and so it's not apparent uh, up front which of these effects dominates is it better to have higher concentration of referrals so that the lemons so that the pool is pretty good or is it better to have uh, even distribution of referrals such that the um, more firms get to uh, screen more employees. And our first sort of uh, important theorem in our paper is that uh, reducing the fraction of workers with no referral increases productivity. So a more equal distribution of referrals is actually good for productivity. And I'm not even taking a stance at the moment on what's fair. And even if you're a pure libertarian, you care only about the productivity, you should be happier with labor markets that have a more equal distribution of referrals. Um, so now we can start to think about, it, it, all of that made sense to talk about, even if there was only one demographic in the society. But now I wanna focus on what happens if workers are of two types. And so I'm back to my uh, model in which I have the uh, blue circles and the green triangles, the two types of workers. Uh, and I'm going to assume a extreme form of homophily, that is workers only refer their own type. Um, we'll see later that this actually isn't in and of itself a bad thing, um, even though it might sound bad. It's not, it doesn't imply inequality by itself, but uh, it does have an issue, it, it does uh, have some generational issue if the uh, employment rates are unequal across the, the populations. Uh, so what, what this is going to do is, let's imagine as in this picture, that the current employment is much higher on the blue population than the green population, the blue circles versus the green triangles. So 100% of the blue circles are employed and only 50% of the green triangles are employed. Uh, now, what this means is that there's gonna be way more collisions of referrals in the next generation workers among the blue population than the green population. And I, I hope that's apparent from the picture. Basically, the idea is that the green population, there's very few employed greens. They're drawing referral, you know, they're referring somebody at random from their own type and they're not very likely to refer the same person because there's just so many, un, you know, so, so many more uh, next generation workers of their type than employed workers in the current generation. Whereas the blues are much likelier to have collisions in the referrals. And so we already learned in the last few slides that having an unequal distribution of referrals is bad for productivity. And so what you can see right now immediately is that having unequal employment rates across two different demographics it causes an unequal distribution of referrals and thereby also causes uh, a lower productivity than if we had a society with uh, equal employment rates or, or no groups, no differences across groups. Um, and so what we've, what we've seen is that more inequality in current employment implies more inefficiency. So the society is less productive. Uh, I will also argue that it gives you a higher employment and wages of the majority group uh, or the one that has higher employment rates compared to its population percentage. Uh, and also interestingly, the minorities in the pool have a higher ability than the majorities in the pool. And on the flip side, the uh, majority uh, among employed workers, the majority type has a higher ability. So let me just uh, get into that very briefly. Um, here is the uh, discussion 
of wage inequality. I won't have time to get into this very deeply, but one thing you can notice is that the wages of a worker are really a function of how many referrals they get. So if a worker has many referrals, they can negotiate up their salary, right? Uh, and that's that's natural to, to think, and, and um, there's some formal models that, that suggest how high the salary can be, but you know, the basic idea here is that if I have more referrals, I have a higher salary, since uh, the blues have more, ref uh, a blue worker is more likely to have more referrals, the blue uh, workers are gonna have higher salaries. Um, and so employment inequality tends to imply wage inequality. There's some subtleties here that I don't have time to get into, basically um, because of that lemons effect that we discussed, which determines how high the high wage is. And uh, we discussed that a bit in the paper. But, but this sort of general uh, sort of intuitive conclusion uh, typically holds. So to recap, uh, what we've seen is that concentrating referrals uh, through, for example, inequality and unemployment is going to increase efficiency and inefficiency and wage inequality. Um, and that these happen due to just different distributional effects in the referral network. Uh, and this is a, you know, maybe a, a subtlety or a minor point, but if you are trying to impact the world and change referral network distributions, you should keep in mind that how you change the distribu dif distribution will have different impacts or might have more impact on inefficiency versus uh, inequality depending, wage inequality depending which part of the distribution you impact. But instead of going down that road, what I'd like to now discuss is dynamics. So what happens across many generations? Can we, uh, do we see poverty trap? So in my dynamic model, time is gonna proceed in periods. Uh, so in each period, it's going to be a copy of the setting that we've already been thinking about. The uh, current workers in period T are each going to refer one worker from the future period, from period T plus one, and the firms are going to take that hiring threshold we talked about, apply it, and uh, decide who to hire from period T plus one based on this uh, hire, hiring threshold. And it should be pretty obvious that, you know, current employment rates are going to impact future employment rates because uh, if you have, a, you're more likely to get hired if you have a referral, since you have a chance to get hired on the referral market as well as on the, uh, in the pool of unemployed workers. And uh, you're more likely to have a referral if you're a blue worker. But to tease apart some of the subtleties here, I need to, uh, enlarge my model to talk about different types of workers and, and employment levels of these workers in any given generation. So I'm going to say that I have a mass NG of green workers and NB of blue workers. Uh, so the total mass of workers N in the market is NG plus NB. I'm going to say that the employment levels of the green workers are EG, that is a mass EG of green workers is employed. So EG is something less than NG. And EB is the mass of employed blue workers. Uh, I also am going to introduce this homophily parameter. Um, this is the probable HG is the probability with which a green worker refers a next generation green worker. So if I'm a green worker, I'm going to refer a green worker with probability HG and a blue worker with probability one minus HG. And HB is defined similarly. Now conditional on referring a worker of a particular type, I'm gonna refer someone at random from that type. Um, so now you can think about the referral rate that is in an equal world, at what rate would a green worker be referred? Turns out to be this equation on the slide. Uh, you, you, can, you can sort of argue this to yourself if you want, um, but the, the point is that the parameters of the model let me define the rate at which greens would get referred if the society had equal employment. And you can also then think about referral bounds. If the society had equal employment, uh, would referrals be proportional to the representation in the population? That is RB over RG, the uh, 
factor more number of referrals given to blue workers, is that equal to the factor more by which blue workers are represented in the population? If that is the case, if that equality holds, we say that there's referral bounds. That's actually, that, that's you know, a good thing. Everybody's getting referrals in proportion to how much of the population they, um, they take up. So the first observation is that if blues are relatively more employed and relatively more referred, then in the next generation, blue employment is still higher than green employment. So, you know, if we start out unequal, we, we're still unequal in the next generation. The wages are higher. There's also this interesting effect I alluded to before that the employed blues have a higher value than the employed greens, whereas the unemployed greens have a higher value than the unemployed blues. And this is, I think, uh, interesting, although a side point, because if you're a very naive firm and you're just trying to estimate the uh, ability levels of different demographics based on the employees inside your firm, you might uh, have a mistake in your estimations if you don't anticipate this fact that you got to see, you got to screen blues more than uh, greens and therefore you were able to pick off, you know, cherry pick among the blues better than you could cherry pick among the greens. Um, Okay, so that was about one generation that, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have inequality in gener generation X, you have inequality in generation Y. Uh, but what about when we repeat this game over T periods? And uh, what you can see is that there's actually convergence. Um, and that's, that's pretty obvious when you think about it because in every period, there's gonna be some workers who fail to pass the hiring threshold on the referral market, the firms that had those referrals are then going to go to the unemployed pool. And hiring in the unemployed pool, I defined it as we just hire somebody at random. So it's completely unbiased. And so if we do this period after period after period, eventually, uh, because you're always mixing in a little bit of this unbiased distribution, eventually you're going to uh, converge to equality. Um, uh, that is, of course, conditional on there being referral bounds. So you could get uh, persistent inequality if, for example, there's asymmetric referrals. Uh, this would be like, say, uh, women refer men more than men refer women. That would be some sort of asymmetric uh, referral. And then you could get persistent uh, employment inequality. Uh, you could also get persistent employment inequality if there's uh, necessity of investment, and this is something that certainly happens in society. Um, you need to invest in your education for many jobs in order to be uh, uh, qualified to do that job in order to say improve your, in the context of this model, improve your value. You have to invest in yourself to improve your value. And if you are from a group that's underemployed relative to your population, there's less incentives to invest in and investment in your in your own education is costly and there's less incentives because it's less likely to pay off because they're less likely to get a referral and thereby uh, you have a less uh, high chance of being hired in the labor market than the other demographic. Um, but even when employment converges, it can take a long time. And so that brings me to my last point, which is can we do something to speed up this convergence and make sure that it can, that the society converges to uh, equal employment as fast as possible? And the policy that I want to discuss is affirmative action. Um, so here, uh, in the context of the model, all I mean by affirmative action is I'm going to increase green employment in the current period and see how it impacts all future periods. Uh, so it's, so I'm sort of agnostic to how uh, the affirmative action is uh, applied, but you can imagine many ways that it could happen. One is that you might set quotas on green hires. Um, so the Scandinavian countries, for example, require for publicly traded firms that their board consists of 40% of women. Um, so 40% of the board members of publicly traded firms are required to be women. Uh, you could also imagine subsidizing green hires. So for example, uh, many of my professor friends 
uh, the universities have scholarships for uh, minority students and then uh, this makes the minority student easier for my professor friends to hire into their research groups because they're basically, you know, cheaper to hire in. Um, you could also require the firms to interview greens, so interview minority types, this happens a lot. Uh, you could also tax the hiring of blues. Uh, this is maybe a little bit um, repugnant, and so I, I'm not quite sure I can point to an example of it, but that, that would be another way to increase green employment. But again, all I, I wanna study is if we have a way to increase green employment in the current period, what is the impact of that? And the first thing to note is something that I think is actually took us by surprise, which is that uh, there, it could be that by increasing green employment in the current period, you actually decrease green employment in the future period relative to what it would have been if you didn't mess with the labor market. And so that's, that's surprising at first, but if you think about it, when we increase green employment in the current period, what happens is that we move from that high concentration of referrals to the more balanced referral market. And in the more balanced referral market, firms are hiring more on the referral market because the lemons effect is larger. So there's more risk in going to the pool. And so they're more likely to hire on the referral market if there's a, a you know, even distribution of referrals. And if the, you don't pump up the green employment enough, then you still have a bias towards blues on the referral market. And since there's more hiring happening on the referral market, um, that could result in uh, actually decreased employment of greens in the future because greens had been getting hired mostly from the pool and now the referral, all the there's less like firms going to the pool. So uh, that's a little surprising and a little disappointing for uh, proponents of affirmative action. But what we can show is that if you apply the policy wisely, you can guarantee an increased green employment, not only in the next period, but in fact, in all future periods. So for any current levels of green employment, think about a world in which I increase it a little bit, some modest increase through some affirmative action policy, and compare that world with the affirmative action policy to the uh, parallel universe in which I didn't do the affirmative action policy. On the plot on the left, you can see in one of our simulations, what happens in these two worlds to green employment. The bottom line is the uh, universe without affirmative action. And you can see in the period, and, and in the current period, the uh, level was 0.3 and I've, I'm considering a policy of increasing it to 0.4. And so of course, in the current period, green employment goes up, but it also goes up in the next period and the one after that and the one after that. So it continually goes up. And also, if you now look at the plot on the right, we can think about what happens to production uh, as a function of affirmative action. And what you can see is that, well, clearly in the current period, affirmative action hurts production uh, because I am forcing firms to take some uh, lower valued workers in, or, or reject some higher valued workers uh, in order to comply with the affirmative action policy. But in the very next period, because of this uh, more equal distribution of referrals, it causes an increase in production. And in fact, for every period from thereafter, and it's a little hard to see in these particular plots, but the, the affirmative action line, except for the first, for period zero, the affirmative action uh, universe always has higher production than the uh, uh, universe without affirmative action. So it's good for equality, but also for productivity. And so now to recap, um, I these are sort of the main, points of this section, affirmative action is long lasting uh, as long as, uh, and the reason that it's long lasting is because it has uh, an effect on employment and future periods or sort of a ripple effect of an affirmative action policy that you impose today. Uh, and that 
uh, changes, the way that happens is by changing the future referral networks. It's also, um, we, we've seen that modest changes in affirmative actions uh, in employment through affirmative action is going to improve all future periods, employment equality, as well as productivity. Uh, and arbitrary changes in particular, large swings in the labor market that are imposed uh, on the labor market can actually uh, cause drastic changes in the referral distribution, which would then uh, potentially harm future equality. Um, so that's like the main policy uh, issue I wanted to raise with you in the context of this talk. But in our paper, we also look at another one, uh, which is firing workers. And so uh, what we show there is that countries or like governments that adopt policies that make it easier to fire workers actually can have uh, lower inequality and higher productivity as a result of this uh, policy of making it easier to fire workers. And why is that? That's basically because if I go to the pool and I have to, you know, I'm a firm, I have to go hire some worker from the pool, either because my referred worker had low ability or because I lost competition for a referred worker of high ability. When I go to the pool, it's not so risky because if I end up hiring a lemon, like one of these referred workers that was rejected on the referral market, I can just fire them and try again. And so because hiring in the pool is less risky, more firms are doing it, but also, uh, and, and thereby doing less of hiring on the referral market, but because the pool has, um, like there's no bias in the pool, uh, whereas there is bias in the referral market, this um, causes less, this lowers inequality. And as we've seen, inequality and productivity go hand in. So that's, that's another policy, you know, I'm sure there's many more that, that you can consider and, and we talk about some of them in our conclusion. Um, but, you know, the, the main takeaway here is that current inequality negatively impacts both future inequality and productivity. Inequality in wages and employment, productivity and immobility are all linked to this concentration of referrals. Um, affirmative action can have positive long-run implications if it's if it's uh, applied correctly. Uh, and sort of a, a higher level point here is that um, you know many important policies are designed to address symptoms of inequality, and I see this happening a lot. And I I'm, you know strongly support these policies like universal basic income, universal health care, and so on. But I think in hand in hand with that, we really need to think about policies that address the causes and not just the symptoms of inequality in order to eliminate the persistence. And this paper and this talk, I've uh, illuminated one cause, which is biases in the distribution of job referrals. And I suggested one solution, which is the policy of affirmative action through things like subsidized internships for minorities. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That, that, that was truly amazing. And I, I think that the question I want to start with is um, you, you really did a great job of linking inequality to immobility to productivity. And it seems like uh, the solution here is to start at the site of jobs and start, start at the site of referral networks. Do you think that there is also an opportunity to start a bit earlier? Um, is there a way to break that constant chain of generational inequality by starting a bit earlier? Or is the, is the, um, the construction so in embedded that we should definitely break the chains at the side of the job? No, I think there's definitely some policies you could target for earlier. Um, so one thing that I alluded to is that uh, there's this issue of investments to improve your, your value. Uh, so this, uh, it, we should make it cheaper for the minority types to invest in their own value and thereby they will do more investment in their value and become more viable on the labor market. This wasn't in explicitly in my model because I didn't have this idea of investment, but even in the context of this model, um, you saw that networks were super important. And another thing you can do is try to create sort of big brother, big sister programs, mentorship programs to just create more diverse networks. If we can you know, get 
people to refer each other in a you know way that's blind to the demographic because this, their social networks are so diverse and so rich that would also help address this problem. And you could start that at, you know early by in having integration programs at high schools or, or middle schools. And is, is the segregation of our school systems and that you, that slide was really amazing showing how little diversity there were in social networks. Can we start in more integrated school systems, public school busing? Is, is that is that a, a real change maker or is that something that's like, it, we don't have enough data on that yet? Uh, I'm not a, an expert really on the data on these things, but I am a strong believer in uh, going for integration. I think that gives not only you know, children access to each other, to other children of different types and, and thereby increase the, uh, the diversity of the network, but it also gives children access to the resources of other types, like the teachers and the books. But also one thing I wanna note is that paper I alluded to at the very beginning, which said that um, a marginal increase in the employment of one of your peers uh, increases your own employment chances. That paper was really, Clever because what they did was they looked at the draft. Uh, they looked at soldiers that were drafted into the same unit of the army. And then they, uh, so this is done randomly. And hence you get assigned, I mean, maybe it doesn't really work out this way, but you tend to get assigned to a random selection of the society. And then those, those networks are pretty diverse as a result. And it seems like the Great Gatsby curve that you noted, like it doesn't portend well for the United States. It doesn't seem no. like, yeah, if we, if, we, if we don't make immediate changes, it doesn't seem like we're gonna be, um, as we like to say, an, an exceptional nation. Um, do you know if there's like any, any idea in your mind how long that, that can persist? Um, I think unfortunately it's, it's, there's a lot of resistance to change of the type that I think could address this. Um, and also, as I demonstrated in the affirmative action section of the talk, you can't make arbitrary, like you have to either go all the way, or if you're not able to go all the way, then you have to go little by little because you can, if, if you put too heavy a shock on the labor market all at once, it can cause a lot of issues um, and even counter your, what, you're, what you're trying to get to happen. Yeah. And so that that doesn't know like I, that's not a positive message, and I, I'm generally a positive. No, no, no. We, 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 there's <laughs> tremendous work for us to do. But I, I, I want to pivot a bit and ask a bit of a tangential question. So now we have these social platforms that sort of extend these um, our social networks out to digital platforms. Do they help or hinder? Do do, do are these uh, the biases that are, we create and referral networks? Are they um, consequentially made worse by these platforms? That's a great question. And, um, you know, I work for Microsoft and LinkedIn as a subsidiary, which is a highly relevant uh, network in this job, in this uh, labor market context. Um, so I think that the, the network is going to be reflective of the network in society, which has this homophily aspect and, you know, also has the, uh, it, the fact that the minority group is less employed relatively than the majority group. But the thing that online social networks can do that I'm really excited about is they can help uh, fix this sort of referral problem. And, or the, the, sorry, the like, you know, the, they can introduce me to more diverse people. Uh, so LinkedIn could try to recommend to me people from other demographics and, and really broaden my network. So I think that there's a great chance to help the world. I also think that there's a tension here because a lot of networks, uh, social network companies try to maximize engagement. And in order to maximize engagement, I have to give people what they're used to, sort of like I, I, it's good for the revenue of that firm to be reflective of my position in my own society because that'll get me on the network more. And yeah. yeah. This was amazing, Nicole. It's really profound, and I, I didn't even think to think about the referral networks and in and vis-a-vis uh, -vis inequality. So, really, thank you for uh, sharing this with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.